Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first Essex County Branch webinar for 2021. My name is Linda Urquhart, and I'm the Research and Library Coordinator for the branch. Just a few instructions before we get started. There will be a question and answer session after the presentation. So in the chat box, please post your questions to me, Linda, and we will answer as many as we can after the session. Also, we will be putting a handout into the chat box uh, during the presentation. So don't forget to download that. This first slide is just a reminder of the sites that you can use for your Essex County Research Assistance. The Ontario Ancestors website is where you find many resources to assist in your family research. Ontario Ancestry is celebrating their 60th anniversary and as such, they're giving perks throughout the year to its members. In January, they announced that they are giving members free access to the MyHeritage Library <laughs> version. Also on their site, you can find the list of webinars hosted by Ontario Ancestors every month. These are free and open to everyone, but to watch past recordings, you have to be a member. The Essex Branch website has information about the branch, its events and its resources, including indexes to our publications, as well as the members only library. The YouTube channel has the past recordings of our branch meetings and our webinars. And the Facebook group and Twitter allow you to meet other family researchers in the area and you can ask, ask questions and, and get their assistance. Many people are willing to help. Ontario Ancestors is celebrating Family Day all week long. So as of yesterday, they've been posting photos and videos at 10 a.m. on Facebook and Twitter. So follow them and don't miss out on the fun. Just go to the OGS website and on the top right corner, you will find the Facebook and Twitter symbols. Just click on them and join their Facebook group and follow them on Twitter. And beginning this Friday at 5 p.m. until Monday at 5 p.m., that's Family Day Monday, the members only portals of the Essex, Kent, Lampton, Niagara and Toronto branches will be open to everyone. For all members of Ontario Ancestors, this is free. For non-members of Ontario Ancestors, you can purchase a $10 weekend pass for this access in the marketplace on the, on the Ontario Ancestors website. Just search for weekend pass and you will find it. And if you do decide to join, that $10 will be accredited towards your membership. So on Friday, when you visit the Essex branch website, you will enter the welcoming page that I'm showing you here. And you can see by the green arrow, that's where you want to go to, uh, to enter our members library link. And here are the, the current buttons that we have in our members library. Uh, as you can see, we do have a lot of material and it'll take you a, a long time to get through it all. The cemetery transcriptions, um, these are just a few of uh, the favorite ones. They have about 70 cemeteries transcribed. There are church histories and church records, family histories. We've got 230 family history files. There are newspaper extractions, um, and those include things like the Amherstburg Echo. We've transcribed the birth, marriage, and death announcements from 1880 to 1960. There's also information from the Comber Herald and the Essex Free Press. Obituaries include the vast collection of David Botsford, um, who transcribed uh, information from many, many obituaries in the county. And the Essex Branch obituary collection includes over 3,800 pages of obituaries with each page averaging two to three obits. So there's lots to, to look at. The school records include the uh, 38 Essex County High School yearbooks, and we hope to be adding more once we can get back into the university to do more scanning. And the Trails newsletter has every newsletter uh, made by um, the Essex branch from 1980 to the present. And we continue to work from home. We're scanning more documents each month and we're adding more material to this virtual library for our members who are unable to visit our physical collection at the Windsor Public Library. So stay tuned. Our next presentation is on March the 9th at 7 p.m. 
and it will be Ancestors in Amherstburg and McGregor Resources at the Marsh Historical Collection. It will be presented by Meg Reiner, the Marsh Collections Coordinator, and Nancy Brown, a retired librarian from McGregor. Tonight's presentation by Dr. Laureen Bridgen Lenny is entitled From the Outside Looking In, Paying Tribute to Essex County's Black Canadian Families. Just a reminder that this presentation is being recorded and will be added to, your, to our YouTube channel as soon as possible. Also remember, if you have questions during the presentation, just post them to me, Linda Urquhart, in the chat box. And again, we will be posting the handout as well. Before Dr. Bridgen Lenny begins, I wanted to tell you a little bit about her. She's currently the assistant curator at the Amherstburg Freedom Museum, where she manages the museum's social media accounts, gives guided tours. She researches local Black families of Essex County and acts as project manager for the museum's Freedom Achievers Program, which is a mentorship and speaker series directed at young persons of color. In January, the museum was the recipient of the Ontario Black History Society's Harriet Tubman Award, Commitment to a Purpose, for their efforts to share Canada's significant Black Canadian history. In addition to her involvement at the museum, she's also a member and director for the Essex County Black Historical Research Society, in addition to being a committee member for the Windsor-Essex County Joint Black History Month kickoff. She has a Bachelor of Arts Honours in History and a Master of Arts in History from the University of Windsor, and her PhD is from the University of Waterloo, where she studied Black Canadian history under the guidance of Dr. James Walker, the author of numerous books, including The Black Loyalists. Her dissertation entitled Lifting as We Climb, The Emergence of an African-Canadian Civil Society in Southern Ontario, 1840 to 1901, focuses on the organizational work of Black Canadians in Southern Ontario and their push to gain rights during the 19th century. She also has written a number of articles and one that's going to be released this year is called An Education Without Walls, The Voice of the Fugitive and the Provincial Freeman as an Unconventional Classroom and it's being published in Black Press, A Shadowed Canadian Tradition. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Lorreen. Just want to turn my sound on here. Oops, sorry, on one second. You okay? Do you need some help, Lorraine? <laughs> It's for some reason trying to kick me out of the meeting. So I'm just trying to, there we go. Okay. We're not seeing your screen though. Okay. There we go. Sorry, it was just um, not allowing me to share my screen for a second. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, perfect. perfect. All right. So uh, thank you everyone for joining me tonight to give my presentation from the outside looking in, paying tribute to Essex County's Black Canadian families. I also wanted to thank the Essex County branch of the OGS for allowing me to speak on a topic that I consider incredibly important. Um, I've been a very strong believer in celebrating the lives of people who have lived and lived in our own communities. And I often find that when looking at Black history, there's a tendency to go to specific names, a core group of names, uh, and as amazing as they are and significant as they are in their contributions, I think it's really important to also focus on people who lived with on, within our own communities and in our region and helped it thrive as well. And so that's what I'm gonna do tonight. Uh, from Since 2018, I've been lucky enough to research and write about local black families in Essex County. 
And throughout my presentation, I'm going to be talking about uh, the different resources that I've been successful in, in using to share uh, this significant history, but also highlight some key examples that I find really interesting. Um, and for anyone who isn't aware of the family histories that I do share, uh, each month um, uh, at the Amherstburg Freedom Museum, I choose a family that lived in this area in Essex County, and I research and write about them. Uh, and so each Tuesday, I will share a piece of that family history, and uh, it's shared on our social media pages, and also it's published on our website as well. And so again, tonight I'm going to be talking about some of the resources I use to share that history, but also highlight some examples as well. So I want to start with where I actually start in terms of my research process. Uh, you'll see here an image of some of the binders that we have in the museum's collection. And there's a variety of topics uh, that are discussed within these binders. And so, so I'm going to talk about a couple of them. Um, but the first one that I always go to is the family history records that we have. It's alphabetized binders for Black Canadian families in Essex County. And within these binders, it has things like newspaper articles, photographs, written accounts from family members, family trees and genealogical information, including marriage records, birth records, death records, and census records as well. And the information isn't just limited to Essex County. It also incorporates uh, Ontario, um, the entire country, Canada. There's documents for that as well, and the United States as well. So it's not just limited to Essex County. It branches out beyond that. I also have looked to church records as well. Uh, in the church records that we have, we have information from uh, churches that are in Canada and the United States. Uh, we also have minute books from the Amherstburg Regular Missionary Baptist Association, which is also called ARMBA. And I found that that uh, resource was uh, particularly helpful to myself before I even worked at the museum. When I was doing research for my PhD dissertation, I actually I was lucky enough to look through the museum's collection and I looked through the ARMBA minutes, uh, basically to look into the activities that were going on in the church, the activism that was happening uh, that branched out from the church and also individuals that were involved as well. So myself personally, I have benefited from um, the church records that, e that exist in the museum's collection. Uh, also in the collection are newspaper articles, biographical details for ministers, and also church connections as well to the Underground Railroad. Uh, for anyone who's uh, listening who isn't familiar with the Amherstburg Freedom Museum, on our property we have a church, it's called the Nazare African Methodist Episcopal Church, and that was a terminus in the Underground Railroad. So that was a place where freedom seekers would have received things like food, shelter, clothing, also an education too because it was a schoolhouse for a brief period of time. Also, it was a place of organization and activism, as I'd mentioned previously. Uh, it was a place to get connections to people in terms of job opportunities and uh, land opportunities as well. So the church was really the heart of the community. So church records can really tell a lot of information. In our collection, we also have military records as well. Uh, you'll see um, that I've noted that we have pay lists from the War of 1812 and Upper Canada Rebellion. Uh, and you'll notice two examples that I provided from family histories that I've written. So this first um, document you'll see on the top of the screen is a pay list from Captain Caldwell's company in Upper, the Upper Canada Rebellion. And at the bottom of the list, there's a listing for John Mulder. Now, John Mulder was part of Captain Caldwell's company, and I was able to incorporate that part of his history into the Mulder family history. The same applies to the image below. That's a photograph of Jeremiah Harris, and he was part of the Essex Colored Militia, and uh, he served his country just uh, like John Mulder would have uh, in the Upper Canada Rebellion. And I bring these two examples up because I think it's incredibly important that people uh, rethink military history in Canada because, at least from my own perspective, I don't think that people often connect the participation of Black Canadians in terms of military campaigns, particularly earlier campaigns like the War of 1812 and the Upper Canada Rebellion. There may be um, people who know about contributions in World War I and World War II, but I don't think that um, as few of of exa examples of those there are, there were so many people who fought, but so few people who are aware even of World War I and World War II. But even more so, I think people are even more surprised to hear about the War of 1812 and the Upper Canada Rebellion. And these are two clear examples of men who did uh, fight for their country. And, and to me, in these family histories, I really do want to 
use these family histories as a vehicle upon which I can um, share a more complete history and talk about the contributions, not just about the individuals, but their contributions to the larger picture and things like military history as well. Now, we also have in the museum's collection service records and lists from World War I and World War II. And as I mentioned, I, again, I don't think that people um, connect enough the participation of Black Canadians. The same thing applies for World War I and World War II. There are so many uh, local Black residents who served uh, in, the, in both campaigns, and I think it's really important to recognize that, uh, not only in these family histories, but, but anytime you're discussing military history as a whole. Uh, these uh, military records also have biographical information about those who served, in addition to newspaper articles and photographs as well. So there's quite a bit of information that are in the collection uh, in terms of what I've been able to incorporate in the family histories, and John Mulder and uh, Jeremiah Harris are part of that. So I don't just focus solely on the museum's collection, I do branch out beyond that. And uh, I do look to newspapers. That's one resource that I find incredibly important. I don't know what I'd be able to write without those resources. And the one thing I, I wanna just make clear is that oftentimes when researching local black families in this area in terms of their connection to the Underground Railroad and enslavement, the documents that are there that talk about that, they're often either non-existent or incredibly difficult to find. And I'm saying this from my own perspective. I mean, of course, there are family members who are related to the families that I write about who have more documentation than I do. I'm just talking about my own personal experience in researching these families, uh, because of course, uh, there's information and documents that have been passed down through the generations with many of the families I've talked about. Uh, sometimes I do have access to that information, sometimes I don't. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the family connections and involvement of de descendants of the, these families I talk about or write about uh, towards the end of my presentation. But I just want to make it clear that these examples that I'm about to bring up um, are, are not are, they're pretty rare to, to come across. And so I'm incredibly excited when I do get to share these because it's almost like I'm giving a voice to these, these significant figures. Now within newspapers, uh, obituaries and death notices are uh, incredibly valuable uh, pieces of information. And I'm sure a lot of you have already looked, I mean, I, I heard Linda mention, mentioning all the resources uh, you have on your site. Uh, and one of them that I find particularly helpful is obituaries. Uh, that's often one of the first places I start in newspapers uh, because I find that they give the most detailed information when talking about a freedom seeker's uh, life before they came to Canada. Uh, and one place that I do look to is our Digital World newspaper collection, which I'm sure um, many, if not all of you, have heard of that collection already. It's uh, digitized newspapers, and it includes local newspapers like the Border City Stars, uh, the Essex Free Press, the Essex Record, and to me, most importantly, the Amherstburg Echo. I found that the Amherstburg Echo has been by far the most generous in terms of talking about Black life in Essex County. Um, it doesn't just focus on Amherstburg, it also talks about the rest of Essex County as well. And, uh, and again, within um, those newspapers, the obituaries that I found um, have been um, a, a very valuable resource. Now, some of the examples that I've found are more detailed, some are quite brief. And I'm gonna give an example of both that I've come across um, in, in this presentation. So I'm gonna start with a shorter um, reference in a death notice. And this is for uh, James Hawkins. Now it, in his, um, his death notice, it says, quote, deceased was born in slavery, but made good his escape and came to this country about 40 years ago and has resided in Anderton ever since. Now, on first, at first glance, this might appear to be a very limited document, but as I mentioned, the information that, at least based on my own experience, I have to, to emphasize that again, at least in my own experience, uh, this information is not always readily available. So even the smallest little detail um, is, is a lot to me. Uh, and there's important points that it does bring about. It talks about, it, it confirms the fact that James Hawkins was born into slavery. And that's a really important point. I think when uh, oftentimes when people look to the Underground Railroad and to Black settlement, a lot of times people assume that it was only freedom seekers escaping enslavement that came into Canada, but there was actually a significant free black population that came into Canada as well. And so this document, it does confirm that James Hawkins was uh, part of the group that was a freedom seeker escaping slavery. 
it also talks about when he came to Canada and where he resided as well. So even though at first glance, this might appear like it's not giving me a lot of information, it actually does give quite a bit of, of, of detail. And also it, it allows me, uh, sometimes the smallest little detail can act like a bridge leading me to further information down the line. Now, other Underground Railroad connections um, and connections to enslavement are found in obituaries that um, are, are quite detailed. Um, again, these are not examples that I come across all the time, but I did want to share this particular example. It's for Henry Banks, and I came across this obituary uh, when I was researching the Stokes family. Henry Banks actually married uh, the daughter of Peter Stokes, um, her name was Virginia, and I soon discovered that um, she was also referred to as Sarah, which complicated the research process a little bit, but I was able to figure that out. And uh, so Henry's obituary, it has, this is only a small portion of what the obituary talks about. Um, so there's several parts to it. Um, but in terms of Henry's uh, obituary, there's actually quite a lot of detail. And the reason for that is because years before he passed away, he was interviewed by the Amherstburg Echo and was able to share a, a significant amount of information about himself and his family, including his father, Daniel, and his, um, not only his himself being born into slavery, but also his escape to freedom. And so I'm going to just share a little bit from the actual obituary to show you how rich in detail uh, some of these obituaries can be, even though the subject of the actual obituary is Henry, not Daniel. So I'm going to just quote directly from it. Uh, so it says, born in Malden, Henry Banks was born on the Elliott Farm in Malden. His father had been a slave in, at Richmond, Virginia. When he discovered that he might be sold down the river, he had decided to escape with the aid of a white man. The two of them walked from the plantation to Cul Culpeper, Virginia. Daniel Banks found work in the salt mines there and remained there for some time. Deciding to get to Toledo, he took the Underground Railway, which was a covered wagon in which a load of colored people were transported from one station to another until they reached their final destination, which in Mr. Banks's case was Toledo. He remained there until the Fugitive Slave Law was enacted when he again fled the bonds of slavery and escaped by way of boat to Canada. The Elliott Farm was a Canadian terminal for slaves and Mr. Banks went there. He rented a piece of land from Colonel Elliott as many other escaped slaves did and remained there for some years. Then he moved to the White Farm in Anderton about a mile from the intersection of the third concession of Anderton and Texas Road. So this is a, a clear example of an obituary that offers a significant amount of information. Uh, even though the subject of the obituary is actually Henry Banks, it shares a lot of details about his father. And one thing I did want to point out uh, before I move on is, is that I feel it my responsibility when I'm writing these family histories and sharing them, that if I come across information that I can fill in some gaps, I feel that it's my responsibility to do so. And one example comes out in this um, actual obituary here. It's talking about the Elliott Farm and how it was a terminal for enslaved persons, of which enslaved persons is the correct word. Slave basically implies that that's who they were, but you want to use the term enslaved person because it's uh, basically a circumstance or something that that happened to them that was forced upon them. Um, but going back to my point with uh, Elliot, this is uh, referring to Colonel Matthew Elliot. Now he was he was actually an enslaver in Amherstburg. He owned a, a roughly 60 enslaved persons. And so to me, when I read the fa this, this uh, article saying that it was a, a terminal for enslaved persons, I, I feel it necessary to also point out the fact that he was an enslaver as well, because Yes, sure. At this point, uh, at one point, it might have been a, a, a safe place for freedom seekers to come in. But I also feel like I would uh, be doing a disservice to people who were reading it if I didn't give them a fuller picture. And so in the, the family history I did for the Stokes family, when I was referring to this obituary, I do mention following uh, when I write the obituary it, that Colonel Matthew Elliott was also an enslaver as well, um, because I'm not sure if anyone has driven past the property where it used to where it is uh, it used to be, but there's a plaque outside of it, and all it says is that he was a military hero basically, and talks about his military contributions, and doesn't mention him being an enslaver, which has always really bothered me. And so, any opportunity I can can take to basically fill in that gap, I do that, and I did that with the Stokes family here. Now, the same applies to other uh, family histories. 
Uh, now, when I was researching the Alexander family, um, that family is full of educators. And one of them was John Alexander, who's pictured here with his students from the King Street School. Now, when I was researching and writing, or when I was writing, excuse me, the, the Alexander family history, I felt it necessary to talk about segregated education because the King Street School was segregated and that was by law in Canada. According to the uh, Common School Act of 1850, schools could be segregated in Canada. And so I felt it uh, my obligation to talk about segregated education because that's something that John Alexander would have experienced on a daily basis. And so this is uh, my way of trying to give John Alexander as much as I can a voice and talk about his experience because uh, this was what he experienced on a daily basis. This was his truth. So I felt it necessary to talk about uh, segregated education, especially when talking about the Alexander family. So I go beyond just looking at obituaries and news and um, and uh, death notices. I do. I have been lucky enough to find some examples of newspaper articles that are written um, years, sometimes decades after the life of a subject that I'm I'm writing about. And one instance, I'm actually going to talk about three examples of this, but the first one comes with the Hawkins family. And it's an article that I found from the Amherstburg Echo in 1934, and it's titled Rifle Presented to Berg Museum Recalls Escape of Slaves. And it discusses a donation to the Amherstburg Historical Sites and Museum Association in the form of a rifle. But it also, uh, the article, more importantly to myself as a researcher, it also shares the history of its owner, Jim Hawkins. And what leads me to believe that there was uh, participation from family members, which again, I cannot express how important it is to have family members involved in these histories. And, and one of the, the ways that that was done was through these articles that I fortunately get to benefit from when I'm doing the research process. And so what leads me to believe that there was family involvement in this uh, article was some of the details that are shared. Now, some of the details that are shared, I don't think that any that you could come across that without either have been been a descendant of that person or known them personally. Uh, so that leads me to believe that Clara Hawkins, uh, James, uh, his daughter, it makes me believe that she participated in the writing of this article uh, because of some of the details that I'm going to share with you now. Uh, so some of the details that it shares is that uh, is the name of James's enslaver. His name was Vincent Hamilton. He ended up becoming a, a sympathizer of the abolitionist movement, and he ended up um, freeing James. And I say this freeing because he ended up becoming an indentured, indentured servant uh, after he was freed. And uh, so uh, basically, Vincent Hamilton ended up helping James escape later on, um, but it just shows you the complications in terms of um, enslaved versus indentured. Uh, now, the article also shares other details, um, such as James and his future wife, Sarah Scott's first meeting. And that's the one detail that really made me think that a family member was involved because it's, it's such a sweet moment in this article. Uh, and, and so it, it's a detail that I don't know that, you, that would be readily available. So I really feel like Clara or another family member was involved. And so in the article, it says um, that to James, their meeting, quote, aroused his slumbering emotions and they slipped apart when the occasion afforded to whisper their love to each other. And of course, this is likely paraphrased um, from, from the, the author, but um, it is one detail um, that I, I don't know that, you, that would be readily available to to people who were uh, outside of the family or didn't know that person personally. Uh, also, the article shares that the couple married, was married by Edmund Brooks, who later lived in Amherstburg in 1841. And under enslavement, the couple had two children, Jesse, who was born in 1843, and Susan, who was born in 1847. Now, this uh, last detail uh, was a really great find for me because uh, I've noticed, at least in my own experience, uh, when looking at census records of freedom seekers who came into Canada, they're not always listed. Uh, or the family members who were born under enslavement, sometimes they're a lot older and they have started their own family, so they're listed under a different household. So the connection isn't there in terms of the census record. So to have a written document like this uh, to tell me that those were the names of their first two children and the years they were born was a really great, um, a great piece of information that I found. Also, the article uh, mentions the family's motivation for their escape. 
Uh, Sarah's owner, his name was John Curtis. He was actually a notorious drinker and gambler, and he was pressed for money, according to the article. And so he's decided to sell Sarah down the river, which is a common term that you'll uh, likely hear um, when reading types of articles like this uh, being sold further down south. Uh, and so this article, um, it mentions that rather than being separated from each other and their children, they decided to escape. And so the article gives um, a detailed account um, and it says the flight was scheduled for a Saturday night when Jim would be visiting his wife. There was no hitch to the proceedings and they set off without their escape being discovered until they had had a good start. A boatman was hired to ferry them across the river at Ripley, Ohio, and there they found shelter in the homes of an abolitionist. Lying hidden in the houses in the daytime and traveling by covered wagons under cover of darkness, they reached Cleveland after a six weeks journey through the woods. There they took a boat to, for Windsor and arrived without mishap. Jim Hawkins secured work uh, near Amherstburg and by his willingness to work and saving habits, acquired a farm of his own. He here he raised his family free from the shadows of the slave owner's whip as a respected citizen. So quite a lot of detail is offered there. And again, this is, this is, um, a, this is probably the most detailed newspaper article that I've come across. This is only a small portion of the article that was written about Jim Hawkins. And the information that it does provide is, is by far the most generous in terms of talking about a freedom seeker's life before uh, they escaped enslavement and also their escape as well. Now the article also shares further detail, which is connected more back to um, the rifle, uh, the title of the, in the presentation, the, the rifle that's listed in the title of the, the article. And it says uh, that James was actually a skilled uh, marksman, uh, which is discovered in, in the, or shared in the article. And it mentions that while being pursued, um, the bounty hunters who knew James, they knew his reputation and they found out that he was armed. And so according to the article, it said, they, the bounty hunter said something along the lines of what was printed. It says, if that's the mark of Jim Hawkins's gun, I'll stir not a step further. It's as much as our lives are worth. Come, we'll, we'll return. And then it continues to say, the mark of the rifle and Jim Hawkins's reputation as a marksman rendered futile their pursuit and enabled the fleeing party to escape to freedom. So to me, this was the most exciting um, example of a newspaper article that I've come across. And again, this is just a small portion of what is written about uh, Jim Hawkins and, and his, his journey. Um, but again, uh, it, to me, it's, it's really valuable to have the participation of family members. And this is an example of it. It's a bit more of a subtle example because uh, Claire is not named directly except for being the donor, um, but, but to me it's clear that some kind of a, some family member was involved in the publication of this article. And I did want to mention as well too about um, the journey of the rifle itself. Um, so myself and uh, the curator, after I told her about uh, the, the uh, history of this rifle, uh, we tried to find the rifle's location. And after um, we found that after James's daughter, Clara donated the rifle to the Amherstburg Historical Societies and um, Museum Association, we found that there was a Border City Stars article. And that's thanks to Meg from the uh, Marsh Collection, who I think she might be watching tonight. I think I saw her name, but, um, but the Marsh Collection is an incredibly valuable resource. And it's because of, uh, of Meg and her research that we were able to come across this other article that talked about um, the further journey of, of the rifle. And so in the article, it says the historical collection that has been assembled in the Public Library Museum at Amherstburg is a summary and symbols of the evolution of the district. Not the least interesting of the exhibit is the rifle with which a fugitive slave, Jim Hawkins, defied his pursuers and their bloodhounds when he escaped the slave from slavery in 1847 and made his way to Amherstburg via the Underground Railroad. Uh, so we find that it's now been passed on to the Public Library um, Museum in Amherstburg. Uh, and so after that, uh, myself and, and the curator, we ended up contacting a couple of historic sites, anyone that we could think of in the area that might have further information, including Fort Malden, the Park House, the Marsh Collection again, and then Museum Windsor and Parks Canada. But unfortunately, we weren't able to actually find the location of the rifle. 
Now, I did put out a call in that family history asking people who had read it if they had any information on this rifle or its location. And so I guess I should put out a call to all of you tonight who are watching. If any of you have any idea where the location of this rifle is or if you've heard about it, even the smallest piece of information could lead us to uh, a breakthrough. And so if you did have any information, uh, Linda does have my contact information, so I would love to hear from you. So I'd mentioned that uh, there's more than one example of articles that I found that have the participation of family members. And this is a, another example of that in terms of Underground Railroad connections and in, connections to enslavement as well. And so this article is from 1975 and it discusses the historian Alvin McCurdy, whose research collection is actually held at the Archives of Ontario. And as someone who has actually researched through uh, parts, uh, a big part of this collection for my dissertation research, it is a vast collection. Uh, I mean, the, the artifacts that are in that collection, are, they seem endless because there's so much information, uh, photographs, maps, minute books. I mean, there's so much information there. And so I would highly recommend if anyone is interesting, interested in pursuing looking into local Black families, I would highly recommend that. I mean, Alvin McCurdy was from this area, and so a lot of it is local. Uh, and I believe uh, that the Windsor Public Library, they might have some of the Alvin McCurdy fond on microfilm. Uh, definitely call ahead, though, uh, just to double check. But but I think that there is some of that on microfilm for people to access, uh, but it is an incredibly important resource. I, I don't know what I would, would have done in terms of my own dissertation without that. Uh, so I would highly recommend if you look, that you look through that. Now the article itself, it uh, talks about Alvin's love of history, but it also has a brief history of one of Alvin's uh, ancestors, Laura Holton Adams. And in the article, it tells the story of a locket that had been passed uh, down uh, in Laura's family for generations. And it says that the locket was her mother's gift when the daughter was 18 years old. She had formerly received it from her mistress, one Mary Kirk. After Mrs. Kirk's husband, Richard, died, she took uh, Laura and her brother and their mother to Cincinnati across the state line in Ohio and purchased their freedom from there. The family moved to Canada around 1859. The very special locket survived the trip and at some time Laura had her initials LA engraved on it. Uh, and so examples like this, I, I don't come across them that often, uh, but one thing I, uh, in addition to the information shared, I don't always come across photographs either. So when I found this article, I was incredibly happy because it allowed me to put a face to the name because when you're researching and writing about these these families, I mean, it's it's, really nice to actually see who it is you're actually talking about. And also too, I do find that having visuals that accompany the family histories really do draw in uh, people to read them. I think it, it's, um, people really like to have visuals that go along with these family histories. And photographs are not a luxury that I always have. Um, I do, when I work with family members, uh, they're often very generous in providing photographs if they can, uh, but sometimes the, the photographs just aren't available. So I was really excited to come across this particular photo, not only because it talks about Laura, but it talks about the locket that's featured in the story as well. Now, a third and final example of newspaper articles that involve the participation of family members is this article here for the Stokes family. And the article is titled, Days of Slavery Still Seem Real. And in the article, it talks about Peter Stokes, who is uh, shown here with a rifle and a knife. And it talks about the history, a uh, brief history of that, that rifle and knife, but also it talks a little bit more about the Stokes family themselves. And in the example, in, um, in the article, I'm gonna quote directly from it. It says, uh, and these are Peter Stokes's words, uh, my father was a slave in Kentucky and ran away with his whole family because he wanted to be free. This is a gun he carried with them. It claimed three lives in my father's uh, fight for freedom. This knife also did its part. Both the knife and the gun would be used again if my freedom were threatened. Freedom means everything to us. It means life. I'd just as soon be dead or die fighting rather than be a slave the way that my father and his folks were. So I found this, this example to be particularly moving because of what Peter says about freedom and, and the freedom of his family and what he would sacrifice in order to never have to live through what his family members did, but also 
the potential fear that it could happen to him and what he would have to do to defend that freedom. So this was, I think, um, a particularly moving example because these are Peter's words as a descendant of an enslaved person. And uh, also, again, having a photograph of Peter um, was a really great find for me as well, too, um, because it, it has the knife and the rifle in question, but it also shows Peter as well, too, which, again, is not something that I, I always come across. Now, in terms of newspapers, I've talked about several um, parts of newspapers that I've looked to, and I have one more section of a newspaper that, that I do look to in terms of trying to find information about uh, freedom seekers and their descendants, and that's advertisements. Uh, because upon arrival in Essex County, freedom seekers and their descendants, both men and women, they established businesses and used the press to advertise their businesses, as any business person would do if they had the means to do so. And so these two examples here, uh, there's three examples technically on the screen, but two of them are for the Foster family. And uh, the one at the very bottom on the left is for Miss Clara Hawkins, who ended up marrying into the Brantford family. Now, the, uh, the articles or the advertisements themselves, I'm going to start with the one that's dealing with Levi Foster. He was actually quite the businessman. He was an entrepreneur. He started several businesses and two of them were advertised uh, in the Amherstburg Echo. The first one is for a livery stable that he had on Apsley Street, which is now Sandwich Street, and also his stagecoach business, which transported patrons from Miss, Mr. Marie's Tavern in Amherstburg to Mr. Beeman's Hotel in Windsor. And uh, again, Levi Foster was quite the businessman and it wasn't just these two businesses he established. Uh, he started off as a plasterer and then started these businesses, but he also opened a tavern as well in Amherstburg. And there's actually a really interesting story that goes along with that tavern because Levi Foster, he ended up um, attending a temperance debate. I mean, temperance was a very big thing going, a big movement going on in the 1850s especially. And so he attended a temperance debate. And at that debate, one of the debaters said that a tavern owner was worse than an enslaver. And so Levi Foster didn't want to be to himself, but also to the community as a whole. He didn't want to be seen as worse than an enslaver. So he actually closed down his business, his tavern the next day. Uh, so I've always found that to be a really interesting story, uh, not only showing what a businessman he was, but a, a very moral person who was going with the temperance movement of the time and was affected by, by that movement. Now, another example I found it highlights the fact that it wasn't just men who were advertising in newspapers, women also advertised as well. And so this example is for Clara Hawkins Brantford. And so I talk about Clara in both the Hawkins family history and the Brantford family history. And in it, uh, she's a female entrepreneur and she advertised her dressmaking business in the Amherstburg Echo. And in the advertisement, it says, dressmaking, Miss Clara Hawkins is prepared to do all kinds of needlework at Mrs. Wright's residence, 60 King Street, in a style equal to any in town. Dressmaking in the latest style, especially attended to at very reasonable prices, patronage respectfully solicited. So this is a, a clear example of how it wasn't just men who were advertising. Um, but one further point I wanted to make about advertisements is that these are clear examples of entrepreneurial pursuits of Black Canadians. But to, I would argue as well that these are visual examples of uh, visual um, examples of uh, contradicting or excuse me, countering uh, negative stereotypes that would have followed freedom seekers and unfortunately their descendants as well once they arrived in Canada. Uh, I mean, sadly, negative stereotypes uh, followed Black Canadians and African American freedom seekers once they came into Canada. Oftentimes, uh, racist uh, white residents would uh, claim that they were uh, immoral people, uneducated, um, not good with money, uh, drunkards, and not respectable people and, and we're gonna be a drain on society. So those are some of the negative stereotypes that sadly followed freedom seekers once they came uh, into Canada. And so uh, with these advertisements, I feel like they were a visual example that countered those. Um, I mean, one more um, common example you might have seen is photographs. Uh, photographs were a medium that uh, Black Canadians used uh, and African Americans as well used to counter these negative stereotypes. Uh, for example, a woman who would be dressed in her finest dress or a man in his best suit. 
uh, also uh, holding a book or having a very nice backdrop in the background and some nice furniture that they would sit on. That was meant to portray the, the sitter as educated, respectable, um, financially uh, well off um, and, uh, and moral people. And so I feel like these advertisements, I would argue, do something similar. Um, I mean, of course, I feel like visuals like a photograph would be uh, more effective, but I think that this is a branch of that uh, where they showed, particularly for business owners in smaller communities where everyone would know who they were, they'd see, oh, well, Levi Foster is putting out this advertisement. Maybe he's not an imm immoral person who's bad with money. He's a business person, he's educated, he's financially savvy, and he's going to be uh, contributing to society rather than being a drain on it. So I feel like these advertisements serve that purpose. So I don't rely solely on um, newspapers and the museum's collection. I do look to other uh, primary and secondary sources as well when researching uh, local Black families in Essex County. And one of them is A Northside View of Slavery by Benjamin Drew. Now, for anyone who's interested in reading this resource, it's actually available on Documenting the American South. And um, I've listed that on the list of resources that I shared with, uh, with Linda and Kim, and I believe that they shared it in the chat section. Uh, so you'll be able to see the list of resources I have. And on that is Documenting the American South. Now that is a digital co digitized collection. Um, a lot of the documents are US based, but there are examples of Canadian um, people living in Canada as well. Some examples might sound familiar. Uh, there's autobiographies about Henry Bibb, uh, Samuel Ringgold Ward, Josiah Henson, and the Reverend Isra Israel Campbell. Now, those are th uh, four examples um, that deal more with the Canadian context. But again, I will say that a lot of the resources that are on documenting the American South are more uh, American-based. But, but there are a few gems that talk about uh, the Canadian side of things as well. And included that in that is the Northside View of Slavery, uh, written by Benjamin Drew. And that uh, book is written accounts of freedom seekers who established themselves in places like Amherstburg, Sandwich, Windsor, Colchester, Gosfield, and also places outside of Essex County as well, including Chatham, Buxton, Dresden, London, Toronto, and Hamilton. So those are just some of the places that are listed. There's, there's uh, several more locations as well, but those are just some that I, I highlighted. Now, while researching the Greer family history, I came across this account from David Greer. And in it, he says, I was born free in Maryland, was stolen and sold in Kentucky when between eight and nine years old. In Kentucky, I was set free by will. And as they were trying to break the will up, some of the, my claimant's friends persuaded me to come off to Ohio. From Ohio, I came here, Colchester, on account of the oppressive laws demanding security for good behavior. I was a stranger and could not give it. I had to leave my family in Kentucky. I came in 1831. I've cleared land on lease for five or six years, then have to leave it and go into the bush again. I worked so about 13 years. I could do no better and the white people I believe took advantage of it and to get to get the land cleared. This has kept me poor. I guess I have cleared not short of 70 or 80 acres and got no benefit. I have now six acres. So I felt it, it absolutely necessary to incorporate this part in this uh, written um, account from David Greer into the Greer family history, because I think it's incredibly important to not only focus on the positive side of the history, but also the negative side as well, because there was many challenges that freedom seekers and their descendants experience and still experience on a daily basis uh, to try and just live their lives in this country. And so this is an example of how uh, David Greer um, he gives an account of being taken advantage of in terms of claiming and clearing uh, land and how there was uh, racism in this country and and sadly uh, black Canadians in this area were were um, taken advantage of and in certain instances and treated poorly as well. And so because these are David uh, Greer's words, I felt it absolutely necessary because it allows me to talk about the environment that a freedom seeker and or their descendants lived in. I mean, it's very similar to what I was talking about with uh, John Alexander and how he uh, experienced segregated education as, a, as an educator on a daily basis. So I feel like because this is David Greer's, as I referred to with John Alexander, their experiences, their truth, I felt it incredibly important to incorporate uh, this, uh, this account into that uh, because 
it's not often that you come across um, the actual firsthand account from a freedom seeker in this way. So uh, I would highly recommend um, that people read Benjamin Drew's book because it is a, a very important resource. So I do uh, look to secondary sources as well. Um, Doris Gaspar, her, um, her document, Property Owned by Blacks in the 19th Century, it provides information on land and property ownership from Dalhousie to Brock Street in Amherstburg, and it also provides names and details about property owners and their descendants, in addition to images of the property if they still exist. Now, I used uh, Doc Doris Gaspar's uh, document when I was looking at the Conway family, and in it, um, she refers to the Conway family and says, although not, no documents are registered at the registry office, it appears that Joseph Stevens, a younger son, inherited Lot 18 on his parents' death. Around 1900, Joseph Stevens moved to Cleveland. He rented his house to George Conway, and in 1921, Joseph Stevens sold the property to Lionel Conway. Lionel wa Conway was George's son. And so although I don't always, if for anyone who's read the family histories that I've written, you'll notice that I don't always discuss property ownership and land uh, transfers, but uh, Doris Gaspar's research, it allowed me to include a new component when talking about this family history, in addition to helping me name and sometimes confirm that the person that I'm looking at or the connection that I think a person has with someone else, it, it helps me confirm that detail. So I also uh, look at uh, other secondary resources and by far this next source that I'm gonna talk about is by far the most valuable to me in terms of secondary sources. It's Milo Johnson's book, New Canaan Freedom Land, The Blacks of Colchester Town Township. And this, Milo's extensive research, I'm so grateful to him for all of the research that he did. He incorporates things like family trees, photographs, family histories, birth, uh, death, and marriage records, and census records as well, in addition to his own analysis. And so the reason why I find this source to be so valuable, um, it's very similar to the museum's collection, because as my title um, says, I'm an outsider looking in. I am not a descendant of these families. I just want to celebrate them and show how amazing they were. And so having resources like Milo's book and also the museum's collection, it uh, puts me 10 steps ahead uh, than I would be if I didn't have these resources, especially in terms of family trees, because I'm coming into these family histories blind, not knowing who was related to who. And so having these family trees available uh, and these, this information available, which Milo actually, uh, interestingly, he uses, he references the Amherstburg Freedom Museum collection in his book uh, many times. Uh, but having that resource, it, it puts me 10 steps ahead because I don't have to, the, in some instances, family trees are already created created and I can just go right into the research process rather than trying to start a family tree myself. Uh, so this is an incredible resource and I would highly recommend that that people do uh, do take a look at it or purchase a copy. Uh, we actually do have we sell this book actually on our, our um our uh, gift shop, um, which we just opened last week, I believe. So if anyone's interested in purchasing it, uh, we do have copies. Um, also, another secondary source that I look at, um, I've looked at this on a couple occasions. It's The Long Road. It's written by Charlotte Bronte Perry. And uh, so in this book, she has uh, photographs, uh, brief histories of Windsor's Black community, also brief biographies of Black Canadian residents from Windsor. So if there is a family history that I look at, and I have a couple that, I, that have um, Windsor-based uh, family members, I do look to this book uh, to find information. Also, I've looked to Elise Harding Davis's book, The Black Presence in the War of 1812, Unsung Military Volunteers of North America. And in this book, it has the history of military campaigns, the involvement of Black servicemen, and also biographical details of servicemen as well. So this has also been a valuable resource. I remember using this for the Stokes family, actually. So at the beginning of my presentation and throughout, I did talk about the importance of family involvement, um, descendants of, of these families participating in the writing um, of, these, of these family histories. And by far of all the resources and uh, things that I could look to uh, in terms of uh, these family histories in the research process, having the involvement of family members is by far the most valuable resource. Uh, because oftentimes there's documents that have been passed down throughout the generations and they'll be, they're able to share information with me that I would never 
be able to find without their assistance. So I'm incredibly grateful to the families who have participated in writing these family histories. And I do make sure, sure to uh, thank them in the family histories that I write because I mean, that's the least I can do for them uh, sharing this information and also trusting me to share it as well. And so some of the family members, uh, families that I've had assistance with include the Christian family, um, which Irene Moore Davis, she shared photographs and also looked over the essay that I had written for the Christian family. And she's just such a wonderful person. And I was so grateful to her for, for helping me with that. And also other families like the Taylor family, the Alexander family, Binga, Conway, Nolan, Wilson, Harris, Hurst, and the Parker family, to name a few. Those, uh, those family histories have had descendants uh, who have, have participated in some way. Sometimes it's um, more of a few details, uh, whereas others are able to share um, uh, significantly more information. But in either instance, I am incredibly grateful to the family members who have shared this information uh, because I've mentioned this before, even the smallest detail can lead me to a breakthrough in terms of these family histories. So I'm incredibly grateful to them for, for allowing me to um, to basically ask them for information and, and allowing me to share it as well. I found that it was particularly helpful having family involvement when working on the Parker family history. Other than a few documents, I wasn't able to find a lot of information on the Parker family outside of Alton Parker. Some of you may have heard of him. Um, I've admired him for a very, very long time. He was actually the very first uniform police officer in Windsor and also the very first black detective uh, in Canada. So he is certainly a trailblazer and has done and did so much for this community. And he's pictured in the, the photograph at the top with the top hat on. And uh, so because I couldn't find a lot of information outside of looking at, at Alton, uh, Parker, I decided to reach out to Alton's granddaughter, Sherry and Diane, who were absolutely amazing in terms of providing information. Um, them, along with uh, another relative of theirs, her name was Linda, they uh, shared documents, photographs, and personal stories, again, that I would not be able to find without their assistance. So I'm incredibly grateful to them. And also, um, I remember having these long phone conversations with Diane, which I really do treasure because she would talk so much about um, her family members and what they overcame. And I mean, if there's one word that I would use to describe the Parker family, it's trailblazers. I mean, I'd already talked about Alton Parker, but his daughter, Frida, she was amazing as well. She was among the third and fourth black uh, nurses to graduate from Hotel Du School in Nursing. Uh, so she was certainly a trailblazer in this community as well. She was an activist as well too. Uh, and so Diane would go on and talk about how uh, amazing they, they were. And also I should mention too, Frida, she uh, was married to the first black Canadian uh, firefighter in Windsor as well, Eugene Steele. And so that family is just full of trailblazers and Diane would share a lot of information and stories uh, of things that, um, that her family members did and, and what they endured as well. Uh, I also remember talking with Sherry as well too. Uh, she uh, ended up uh, sharing what I had written with her mother, Frida, which was such an amazing moment for me, the fact that Frida would be willing to, to look through that, that family history and offer suggestions. And so that's what she did. She looked, she read it over with uh, Sherry's assistance and was able to provide feedback, which I happily took. I'm I, The one thing that I want to make clear about these family histories is I want them to be as full as possible, but as accurate as possible. And what better source than having Frida share information about her own family? Uh, and so I remember Sherry also mentioning that it made her mom very happy to know that this family history had been written and that her family was being recognized in this way. Uh, and so it, it, this family history was particularly moving to me, especially because, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, I share a family history each month, and I share a portion of it each Tuesday. And I shared the Parker family history in September of 2019, and Frida actually passed away in September of 2019. She passed away just before I was about to share the final portion of the Parker family history. I shared it on the Tuesday, and she passed away on the Sunday. And so to me, knowing that she had read that family history that I've written and recognize how important she was to myself and to the museum as well. Um, it was a really moving experience being able to share this because these family histories are not just a way for me to, to post on our social media pages or our website. These are really important people to me and I, I 
try to take a, a, as much as many opportunities as I can to to celebrate them. And so, um, so I'm I'm hopeful that uh, Frida would be happy with with uh, the end result having having read it. Um, but uh, especially because I was able to share it before she passed away, it was a really moving experience for me. Uh, the same applies to the Harris family history. Uh, you'll see in this photograph, this is uh, Donald Harris. He was such a lovely person. I knew Donald long before I worked at the museum. He was actually friends with my grandfather. And uh, he actually, um, Donald is connected to Jeremiah Harris, who I talked about at the beginning of my presentation, talking about uh, Jeremiah's contributions in the Upper Canada Rebellion. And so Donald is a descendant of Jeremiah. And the fact that I was able to publish this family history a few months before Donald passed away was again, a really moving experience for me because I wanted to show Donald how important he was to me. And, and as I mentioned, he was friends with my grandfather and I had had conversations with Donald before I worked at the museum. And uh, I would ask him about his history and what it was like growing up in Amherstburg. And he will always say things like, oh, well, you don't wanna hear about that. And he was just such a humble person. And so being able to work with his son and daughter-in-law who were incredibly generous with sharing information about their family, it was uh, a really uh, nice experience uh, and it was great to know that, it was really nice to know that I was able to share that history before Donald had passed away. Uh, in addition to, to sharing this information, uh, before um, people like Donald and Frida passed away, I think it's also other, there's also other significances uh, in terms of these family histories. It's sharing the history with members of these families, but also non-members as well, which I think is, is also incredibly important because that allows them to share in the celebration of these family members as well. It also passes on stories of those who are no longer here, and it all helps to preserve uh, memories that could be lost. And, and don't get me wrong, I do, uh, I, I recognize completely that uh, family members, of course, they are already celebrating their, their ancestors and, and are sharing and preserving these memories as well. Um, but as someone who's um, taking it from the museum perspective, I'm glad that I get to help in preserving these memories as someone who works at a museum and isn't a direct a descendant of the people that I'm talking about. Also, it shows gratitude and appreciation. As I mentioned, I'd known Donald for a very long time and it just felt really nice to be able to pay tribute to him in that way. Uh, it also uh, highlights significant events and show challenges that were faced by Black Canadians in Essex County. As I mentioned, uh, it's uh, when I was talking about John Alexander, talking about him experiencing segregation, teaching at a segregated school on a daily basis. Um, but also uh, other events as well, too, talking about military contributions as well. Um, so being able to highlight that is, is something that I, I try to do in, in each of these family histories. Also building of trust between the museum and local families as well, because I mean, as a museum, I think it's our responsibility to share as much of this history as possible. And in order to do that, we need to build a relationship of trust with the, the families who are so graciously sharing this information. Additionally, it also, another significance is it shows the product of the perseverance of these freedom seekers and their descendants and the next generations that thrive to follow them. So it's not just about talking about the person who established themselves first in this community, but it's also talking about the people who continued because and, and thrived because of, of that earlier settlers' uh, contributions. And so these are just some of the, the reasons why I think it's so important to share these family histories. Uh, and I just wanted to share some of the resources to end my presentation, some of the resources that I use. Uh, I've been talking about many of them throughout the evening. And again, um, Linda and Kim, uh, we're going to share the list of resources that I've, I've uh, provided um, so that hopefully this will encourage you to uh, read the family histories I've written. But I would say even more importantly, if you wanted to look into researching uh, these uh, families independently as well, or your own family members too, uh, because I think it's, it's incredibly important that we, like I said at the beginning of my presentation, we need to focus on local history and the people who built, who built our own communities. And the, the Black community, I think there are so many important figures uh, that are often um, not recognized. And I really think that, that uh, we need to start paying more attention to uh, Black Canadian trailblazers and their descendants uh, because they built this region as well. 
And so to end, I just wanted to say thank you again so much for listening to my presentation. And I would encourage people if you wanted to read more, um, I've only been able to talk about a small portion of these families, uh, the family histories that I've written. I think I'm on um, number 34 in terms of the family histories that I've written. Um, so you can go on to our website, amosburgfreedom.org uh, sla slash family dash history slash, and you'll be able to read the family histories there. Uh, they're all listed and you just click on them and you'll be able to read each individual family history. But again, um, hopefully this encourages all of you to learn more about the significant contributions of Black Canadians in this region, and hopefully to start your own independent research as well, because uh, there is information out there. It's just sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to find them, but hopefully the resources I provided are helpful with that. So thank you so much. Thank you, Laureen. That was great. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, we've got quite a few questions to test you. This is this is how to stump the uh, presenter. So the first one, yes, we'll try my first. best. <laughs> the first one is from Michelle. She's saying if the enslaved person who made it to Canada was then accused by US officials of having committed a crime was the enslaved person sent back to the US. I am so glad you asked that question because there are a lot of myths that exist in Canadian history. And one of them is that Canada was a, you were hundred percent safe once you came into Canada. And so that's not the case at all. I mean, especially because we were so close to the waterfront, bounty hunters did come into Canada and they did try to capture uh, freedom seekers and bring them back. And there are several instances of uh, bounty hunters and enslavers coming into the area and trying to capture people. Now, many of the examples um, talk about how the community came together. Uh, and there was one example up in the Niagara region, for example, and uh, I believe his name was Solomon Mosby. And so he uh, basically was accused of committing a crime. I think he had stolen a horse or he had um, uh, murdered a person who was trying to capture him. And so he, on his way into Canada, committed, so-called committed that crime. And so his enslaver came into the Niagara region and talked to government officials and uh, wanted to bring him back and said, he stole this horse uh, or committed this crime. And so he needs to face trial in, in, uh, in Kentucky where he had committed the crime. And so the government was actually going to allow him to be brought back. There was a law uh, that existed, um, I believe it was in the 1840s and before that. And it stated if you committed a crime, uh, say for example, I had mentioned stealing a horse. If you committed a crime on your way to freedom, you could be captured and forced back to the place where you had, stole, had stolen or committed that crime. So say he committed the crime in Kentucky, he could be brought back to Kentucky to face trial. And so that was along the lines of what was going to happen with Solomon Mosby. And so he ended up, um, they were about to bring him back and the community came together and they said, well, if this can happen to this person, this can happen to me. Even if I didn't commit the crime at all, I could be uh, seen as someone who had committed this crime and be forced to into the same fate as what could happen to Solomon Mosby. So they came together and they ended up um, basically uh, preventing, it, I, I don't want to use the word uh, riot, it was just a group of supporters that came together and they ended up um, allowing, they ended up helping uh, Solomon Mosby end up um, escaping his uh, his bounty hunters. I believe he ended up moving or living in in uh, the UK at one point and then came back to St. Catharines. But that's just an example of how you weren't 100% free. I mean, the same example happened uh, Nelson Hackett. I believe he's a much more local example where he, uh, sadly, what ended up happening to him was the opposite. He ended up actually uh, successfully on the side of the, the bounty hunter and the enslaver being brought to the United States because he actually committed a crime on his way. And so they used that law in order to bring him back. So you weren't a hundred percent safe once you came into Canada. Um, and that was the law that was basically forcing you to go back and face trial in the place that you committed that crime. So, so again, that's a myth that exists in Canadian history that you were hundred percent safe here. Oftentimes we look at Canada as this promised land and yes, it was that, but but it's much more complicated than that because uh, because you weren't 100% safe once you got here because there were opportunities for bounty hunters to use the law to uh, force you back to face trial. And Nelson Hackett is, is a tragic example of that. Great, great. 
Uh, another one, I don't know if this is the same Michelle, but another Michelle, uh, she says, I've been given access to a photocopy of a 42 page clerical list from Maryland of manumitted enslaved men and women. The entries date from 1850 to 1860. Um, their brief descriptions of each person, date they were manumitted, wow. name of person who signed the affidavit. She's, so her question is, did manumission actually free the enslaved person? So that is another great question, Michelle. So when you think about it, I mean, especially with the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, that exposed so many uh, persons of African descent. And uh, sadly, bounty hunters really didn't distinguish between, I mean, with the Fugitive Slave Act, I should clarify, that allowed for bounty hunters to go into free states and, and retrieve uh, freedom seekers. Um, and these bounty hunters, uh, and it also took away other rights as well. It, it um, Basically, if you were caught helping someone escape in the Underground Railroad, you could be fined, put in jail, and possibly worse. And also with that law, bounty hunters really didn't distinguish between a free person and uh, someone who was enslaved. Sadly, as a person of color to a bounty hunter, you were seen as an enslaved person, whether you were free or not. And so there's examples of, of free people being uh, captured and forced into slavery for the very first time in their lives. Uh, so sadly, as, as a person of color, you would have been associated with enslavement. So I would say that you would not be 100% safe. For example, if you were a, uh, a freedom seeker, or excuse me, if you were a free uh, Black resident in the U.S., uh, and you were uh, just traveling here, here and there throughout your community, if you say look similar to someone that they were looking for, or possibly were just a replacement, you didn't look like them at all, but they said, oh, well, that'll make a good replacement for, for the person I'm looking for. Sadly, you could be uh, basically put into the same category as them as an enslaved person, even though you were free. And you might wonder, well, if you have free papers, aren't you free? Well, if you're a bounty hunter and you want to get paid, what's to prevent them from ripping it up or throwing those free papers into the fire? And the word of, sadly, of a white person at that time would have held more weight to a person of color. So you wouldn't have been completely free at that point. So, and that's what encouraged so many people to come into Canada. Now I should make it very clear, once you did come into Canada, you experienced significant discrimination and, and racism as I mentioned a couple examples in my presentation, um, but that's what led a lot of, of uh, free blacks and freedom seekers to come into Canada. And that also goes along with another myth that I had mentioned with the Underground Railroad. That wasn't the only form of, of entry into, into Canada in terms of black settlement. There were free black people that came here as well and people who came independently from the Underground Railroad too. Uh, so, so again, the fugitive slave law and that uh, lack of safety in terms of, well, documentation really isn't even 100% uh, doesn't 100% ensure your safety. Uh, so, so that's what drew a lot of people to come into to Canada as well at that time. Great, great, thanks. Um, just wanted to let you questions. know that Alan Campbell uh, posted a note here. He's the past president of Ontario Ancestors and he's thanking you for your presentation because he's also um, looking from the outside as he's yes. compiling family histories of Blacks in Lambton County. Oh, wow. Fantastic. So he may be able to ask you some questions to help. Yes, I would, I would love to speak with him. And I mean, that's, I mean, to be honest, I'm coming from a completely different uh, perspective um, or um, a different um, state than, say, a descendant of the family members that I research. Because as I said, I'm an outsider. I'm coming into these family histories blind. It's, it's just I, I want to celebrate these families and show how important uh, people on a local level were in contributing to Essex County's history. And so I appreciate uh, uh, his uh, participation as well in trying to highlight this history too. I think we have to work together in order to share this history and, and show how important people were in contributing to their, their own communities. So I would love to hear from him. <laughs> okay, great. And uh, Karen is saying, are there any diary resources, say through the University of Guelph project? And then she says she's referring to the rural diaries, if she has that right. I'm not sure what what that's referring to? Uh, so myself, in terms of, of journals, um, I don't, I mean, uh, there, 
there's a form of journaling that I have. It's when uh, descendants have written in um, documents in the family history collections that I've come across that have shared uh, information about their descendants. I don't have any diaries that directly were written by, um, by freedom seekers. Uh, one thing I will point out is that the illiteracy rates in terms of freedom seekers coming over in the earlier periods. With time, people became more literate, of course, uh, through the efforts of churches, schools, and organizations. Um, but in the very beginnings, um, the, uh, the, literate, the literacy rates would have been um, quite low. Um, I believe it's Donald Simpson. He mentions in terms of the literate population um, in the U.S. Uh, during the, the Underground Railroad period around the 1850s, it was probably about 10% of the population that were actually literate, and that's in the US. And so when you consider the people who actually did come into Canada um, that were literate, the, that, that uh, percentage decreases even more. So being able to read and write, um, that wasn't something that was readily, um, um, that wasn't a, a readily accessible skill at that point. With time, as I mentioned, it, it was, people became more uh, literate, but I don't have any uh, diaries or journals from freedom seekers themselves, but, um, but I do consider the information that uh, family members have written in the family history collections we have to be a different version of, of journaling. Uh, for example, um, when I was researching the Banks family history, one of his uh, descendants, her name was Cordella, she actually talked about um, Anthony Banks and how he was the first county constable in, in Essex County and how uh, a funny story that she would share is that uh, when they had limited, there was limited staff at that time. And so in order to uh, keep someone that he had arrested um, nearby, he would actually handcuff the the uh, criminal to one of his sons in order to prevent them from uh, from escaping. So um, so Cordella wrote that story and talked about another um, uh, ancestor of hers. I think his name was Uncle Uncle Ben, and uh, so he would talk about um, his journey from um, from enslavement and how they would uh, sprinkle pepper. Uh, along the way to prevent the dogs from being able to sniff them out. So, um, so although it's not a, an exact um, example of, of a journal or a diary, I do think that uh, the family history or the uh, written um, accounts from descendants, I would consider that to be uh, as close of a version that I've come to to a journal. But I, I, look, I, I unfortunately haven't come across uh, any, any diary entries, but I would love to hear um, if, if, uh, if, there's, if it's accessible. I mean, of course, with uh, COVID going on right now, traveling anywhere is, is uh, quite limited. And also too, I should mention too, the amount of time that I do have to devote to these family histories, as much as I wanna celebrate them and research them as much as possible, this is just one of the responsibilities that I have uh, working at the museum. So in terms of the time that I do have to read them, it's probably about two, maybe three weeks um, that I, and that's not even a full two to three weeks. That's just when I have uh, the time to actually look at them um, with my other responsibilities. So uh, being able to go through a, a journal, I should add, would probably take um, a significant amount of time to transcribe it. Um, so that would also uh, be a, uh, that would be a limitation in terms of the time that I have to look through them. Um, but I would certainly love to hear more about um, any uh, journals that. Uh, that uh, can be shared, that have been digitized especially, that would be amazing. Great, okay. Um, lots of thank yous and very informative. It was great, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. You did talk a little bit about uh, racism in, in Canada uh, yeah. overall. Somebody was wondering if there was any like uh, organized racial activities like the KKK that you ever saw in Amherstburg or heard about or so there there certainly was uh racism in Essex County it still exists to this day um talking uh, specifically about the KKK uh in the 1950s and 60s and I have to give another shout out to Meg from the Marsh Collection she sent me uh some newspaper articles that were written about an incident that happened in the 1950s and 60s or 60s and 70s excuse me and there was a belief that it was the KKK that was involved um, it was believed, there was uh, an incident where um, there was graffiti that was put on the Amherstburg First Baptist Church, which is, I believe I mentioned on the next street over from the museum. And there was also, um, I think there was a, a cross burning um, 
I'm not totally sure about the cross burning part, but there was also um, on the sign leading into Amherstburg, it said home of the KKK. And so there was a debate that went back and forth whether it was actually the KKK or not. Um, but to me, whether or not it was the KKK that did it, this was still an act of hate. And uh, whether they were trying to draw attention to the KKK or not, uh, this was a clear example of racism that did exist at that time. And, and again, that's another myth that um, we need to get rid of in terms of Canadian history because we had slavery here. We had segregation here. We have and had racism. Uh, and we also had a civil rights movement here in Canada as well, too. Oftentimes, I think we look to the United States to tell our own story, but we have so many um, trailblazers and such a rich history here that we can look to our own history. Uh, and that includes um, when we talk about things like slavery and segregation, uh, civil rights movement here as well. Uh, so, so there were examples uh, to go back to the question, um, out, out, not related to the KKK, but there were certainly incidents that uh, did happen um, where racist whites would attack uh, black community members. Um, I mean, I do recall when I was researching for my PhD dissertation, it involved black activism um, in the area. And uh, there were just organizations that just simply wanted to organize and better themselves. And there would be white, white racists in the, the community who would um, pull a gun on uh, people who were just trying to peacefully come together. Uh, there was one article that I read um, in connection with um, Marianne Shad and, and uh, Samuel Ringgold Ward. It was actually a man who was murdered during one of their meetings. Uh, so there were clearly examples, and this is the 19th century, and, and there's examples of it in the 20th century as well. Um, but these are clear examples of how racism existed and exists in, in Canada. And those are just some of the examples that I've come across myself in the research I've done. And, and so if the instance does come about where I can share that, I mean, I, I don't want to be talking about, I mean, I have to be sensitive to the family members who are, who are possibly reading this, this history. I don't want to be talking about murders that have, have happened, but if there is a way that I can uh, properly approach the history uh, and talk about a fuller picture, including racism, then I'm going to do it. Okay, what about this uh, new, that up. the new article that you're um, working on now uh, for the newspapers, the provincial? Yes, yeah, the provincial Freeman and the Voice of the Fugitive. Yes. So you're you're suggesting that maybe it, it could be added to the Ontario curriculum. Uh, so basically, um, in my uh, my art argument for that article, it actually came about because I was giving a presentation for the uh, for Eckburst, the Essex County Black Historical Research Society, and it was basically just giving an overall picture of what the Voice of the Fugitive and Provincial Freeman were, and what are the key topics that they talked about. And when I was researching researching and writing that, I came to discover that um, that the Voice of the Fugitive and the Provincial Freeman for that time period in the 1850s and, and in the instance of the provincial freemen in the 1860s as well, those were um, basically, I call them unconventional classrooms because it's a school without walls. If you're someone who can access that newspaper, whether you're reading it or whether someone is reading it to you, you can learn skills and learn how to uh, basically adjust to your new life and freedom. And so um, it's not about arguing that those could be used in the curriculum, um, but more so talking about how these primary sources for people at the time who were reading them and, and hearing uh, the information printed as well, that they could learn skills like, um, for example, uh, these newspapers would publish the activities of organizations that would uplift the community. Uh, one example I found, it talked about how members would contribute dues to um, to their um, the organization and that acted kind of like an insurance policy. So if they got sick, uh, they would get, if, after a certain amount of time, if they were under good in good standing, they could receive some of this, uh, this money. So it was kind of like an insurance policy uh, or um, unemployment insurance, I guess you could say. Uh, and so these articles uh, that talked about these organizations would teach people, well, this is how you operate this organization, uh, make sure you have people contribute to it financially so that they can benefit from it later on. Also, you could learn agricultural skills as well, too. I go into great depth talk, depths talking about how um, these newspapers would not only talk about, well, this is how you plant um, a, a crop, but it would also say, oh, well, this person has donated 
a uh, hundred trees and I can do whatever I want with them. So he said to donate them to uh, freedom seekers who were coming into the area. And, um, and so I can use these trees however I like. So I'm deciding to give them all to you. And so they would publish that. And so that would basically give um, a, a, a great start to anyone who was wanting to pursue agriculture um, and, and help them along the way by giving them this, this uh, resource. Uh, so basically with my article, it's just giving different examples of how um, the Voice of the Fugitive and Provincial Freeman uh, um, assisted um, basically the, the reader who I call the student in some instances. Um, I, I share how they um, learned how to uh, become respectable citizens um, who were being taught by black educators because I refer to these editors as educators as well uh, and how they would learn agricultural skills, respectability, how to form organizations and, and basically better themselves. So that's where I'm coming from with the article that I wrote. And did you uh, use the um, our digital world for looking at those papers? Yes, I, it, because it was interesting. I, I was I considered myself among the lucky uh, people contributors to that book because there were several of the contributors that I was working with who had to access archives in order to do their research. Whereas I was lucky enough that. I was able to access our digital world and look at the Provincial Freeman and the Voice of the Fugitive uh, from home and be safe and not have to worry about COVID uh, preventing me from getting into the archive. So I use that source. I, numer I can't even count how many times I've used that source. It's an incredibly important resource. I don't know what I would do without it. And I use that on numerous occasions when I was, um, when I was uh, writing that article uh, that uh, hopefully uh, COVID doesn't delay its publication. Um, but I definitely use that. And, and I, it made me feel, it really um, uh, made me feel awful for the other contributors who had to rely on archives and actually have to access them. Uh, because their their collections were digitized, so um, so I was definitely I definitely benefited from our digital world for sure. And we are lucky that uh, Southwestern Ontario Digital Archives has that on their website, so yes. that we can look at all the, all the different newspapers. So we're yes. very lucky. I do see though that our time has kind of run over the the hour, so uh, I think we'll better wrap it up. Is there any last thing you'd like to say? Words of wisdom. Uh, so I, I think I uh, basically mentioned this in my presentation. Um, I am very passionate about uh, this history. This means a lot to me. And and I, I, the way I, I try to give back is to, to share this history. And I would really encourage people to, to look at this history because this was um, somewhat mentioned in one of the questions about when it, talking about the voice of the fugitive and provincial Freeman in the curriculum. This, is, this history is not in my opinion, appreciated as much as it should be, especially in terms of education. This is something I think that should be mandatory. And if I can play some role in trying to educate people in the community from the museum's um, platform, then that's what I wanna do because um, hopefully I can help fill in a gap that I think it needs to be, so it's, it's, it's drastically in need of being filled this gap because this country was not built on the, the service of, of just white people. There were black Canadians and, and other persons of color that contributed significantly to the progress of this community. So I'd really encourage people to, um, whether or not it's reading the, the histories I've written or doing your own independent research, I, I would highly recommend that you that you look into that because it's something that um, that I think is is underappreciated, and I think that people need to celebrate this history um, more than it than it has been. So. So hopefully, um, if there's anything you take away from this presentation, it's um, not only how much I appreciate and value uh, this, this significant history, but uh, that it's really important that we um, put in our own effort to, to research and, and write about and uh, celebrate these families as well. So hopefully the resources I provided are helpful with that. So, so again, it's, it's very important that we, we celebrate this, this underappreciated history because, because it, is, it is incredibly significant, especially for Essex County. Wonderful. Okay, thank you very much, Lorene. We really appreciate you giving this presentation. And to everyone else out there, um, we'll see you in March, March the same date, March the 9th, for the next presentation uh, with Meg Reiner from the Marsh Collection. Go, Meg. So from Essex County, it's a uh, good night.
Thank you so much, everyone.